Hi, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the final lecture of the semester. I hope everyone is healthy and well out there and hanging in there still. I have a couple of quick announcements um, before I jump into today's material. Uh, the first one, really the only announcement, is about the final exam. It will be open on Canvas from May 13th through May 15th. Um, our scheduled uh, time for the exam was, I believe, 1020 on Friday, May 15th. Uh, in order to get these all graded in time and have time to submit the grades, uh, but still allow you some flexibility to take it, I'm going to open it up a couple of days early. And um, instead of the way I've been doing the last few where I open them up on the day of the exam and let them go through the weekend. Um, yeah, so that will be starting on Wednesday and finished on Friday. It will be on chapters... 10 and 11 only, so it will not be cumulative, it will just be these last two chapters, and it will more or less be the same format uh, as the last two exams. So nothing new there. Uh, I will post a study guide, hopefully this weekend, so you have some time to look at it, and a review lecture. Uh, I'll post both of those as soon as I can. Um, yeah, as always, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to email me. Uh, I guess one more quick announcement is you must submit all homework by May 15th, that Friday of finals. I will not accept any homework after that date. Um, again, I really just need to have time to get everything graded uh, so that I could submit the grades to the registrar on time. All right. Um, I guess we will move on to today's material. So we're going to wrap up the semester here talking about the types of extrasolar planets we're finding, uh, what this means for finding Earth-like planets, and then uh, we're actually going to skip the final section of this chapter on uh, stellar types. Um, yeah, so let's get into that. So here's a graph, and what this graph is is orbital distance here. This is semi-major axis on this uh, x-axis, and the y-axis here is eccentricity. So remember, this is how elliptical is the orbit. Um, with zero being perfectly circular and one being um, uh, a straight line, more or less. Uh, really no longer a bound orbit. So first thing I'd like to point out is the planets of our solar system are mostly down in this part here. So they have low eccentricity. Almost all are circular orbits. Um, so that's the first thing to notice is that many, uh, and our orbits are, are fairly far from the star. Now be careful, this is a logarithmic plot. So one here is Earth's distance. Here's a tenth. Here's ten times Earth's distance, 10 AU. Um, but Mercury is the closest planet here, and it's close enough that it's tidally locked. It's here at about 0.2 AU. Now, a couple of things we can see from this is that there's many extrasolar planets here that are very close to their host stars. And there are extrasolar planets here that are very eccentric orbits. So that's the first thing to make a note of over here is that many exoplanets have orbits closer and more eccentric than planets in our own solar system. 
So in that respect, they don't really look a lot like ours. Also, you can see here, notice these dots represent the size of the exoplanet. And many of these exoplanets are very large. So there are many large, greater than Jupiter, um, very close planets. So in our own solar system, the large planets Jupiter and Saturn are out here very far from the sun. Here we can see many, many large exoplanets that are very close to their host stars. Now, this doesn't mean that there are more large planets or that these systems are dominant. So um, part of this is a selection bias. So selection bias means it's easier to find large, close planets. So we have a, a bit of a bias here. These ones that are very large and very close to their host stars are super easy for us to find compared to ones that are much farther out. The farther out they are, the longer their orbits, uh, the less likely we are to find them, the harder it is to confirm um, their orbits, because we need to see them pass by a second time. Uh, and also, the larger they are and the closer they are, the more they make the star wobble, which is um, two of our effects, two of our detection techniques we talked about last time. So that's just a quick look at some of the orbital properties of extrasolar planets. Now let's look at some of their physical properties. Now I realize this diagram is a little hard to see. I just want to point out a few things on it. Uh, what we're looking at here is planetary mass down here on the x-axis versus planetary radius. So we're looking at the physical properties, uh, the size and the radius of these things. Um, down here are Earth and Venus. We have Uranus and Neptune here, and Jupiter and Saturn up here. So the planets that we're finding, um, there's very few that are down here in sort of the Earth-sized planets. Um, but all of these are terrestrial or Earth-like planets. Um, we haven't found a lot of those. Uh, they're harder to find. We have found many in this region. These are Neptune-like. They are solid. Uh, they have small diameters, uh, small radii, but they are made mostly of hydrogen and helium. Up here, we have the Jovian planets or Jupiter-like planets. And then lastly, up here in this part, we have the hot Jupiters. So a hot Jupiter is a Jupiter-like planet very close to the host star. And that extra heat causes them to puff up, and so they're called hot Jupiters. They're large and they're hot. Um, yeah, so again, part of this is a selection bias, uh, that these hot Jupiters are very close to their host stars, they're very large and they're easy to find. Um, as we move down into this region, um, we will find more of these in the future, as our detection techniques get better. Um, but we're basically finding all kinds of different planets. Uh, some things that are maybe interesting to point out are the super Earths. Those are kind of in this category here. Uh, these ones here are super Earths, so they're very Earth like but much larger, which means they have more gravity, they can hold on to thicker atmospheres. Um, some other ones, these water worlds, these mini Neptunes, those are like Neptune like planets but are much smaller, sort of almost. Uh, as small as an Earth-like planet. So those have some interesting um, possibilities for life on those 
uh, and they're planets we don't see in our own solar system. So sort of new types of planets that we hadn't really expected. All right, so here's a writing prompt for you. Uh, I want you to take a couple of minutes to push pause and write down an answer to this question. Are planets like our own common? All right, so my answer to this is that solar systems are common. And it looks like about 70% of stars have at least one planet. So we haven't looked at every star, but we've looked at lots of stars and we can do enough. We've looked at hundreds of thousands of stars for planets and we can start building robust statistics and applying those statistics to the rest of the galaxy. And so um, by doing this type of statistical analysis, we can determine that about 70% of planets 70% of stars have planets. Uh, from some of this analysis, the evidence also shows that smaller worlds outnumber larger ones. This is kind of like what we saw with stars themselves. And this is despite the bias that we talked about previously and finding large planets. So it turns out that um, the fact that we are finding lots of smaller planets, even though they're very difficult to find, means that there must be lots and lots of them out there. And so what this points to is that Earth-like planets are, uh, I should say, are relatively common. We see those things, we would expect to find lots and lots of them. And again, like I said earlier, more will be found as detection techniques improve. And not only that, um, as we analyze data, so there's still Kepler data is still being analyzed and we're still confirming more and more planets from that mission that ended a few years ago. So um, there is a bias against finding Earth-like planets. Despite that bias, we think that these planets are very common. And as we um, improve our exoplanet detection techniques, we expect to find lots and lots of them through the solar system. Sorry, through the galaxy. Uh, my bad. Here's a, just a quick diagram wrapping up some of that stuff. Uh, here is the percentage of stars with at least one planet. And <clears throat> you can see here that um, most of these systems have either Neptune, uh, super Earth, or Earth like um, planets. So most stars have small planets. Um, <clears throat> only, uh, say, uh, less than a few percent have large planets. So if we add up the numbers here, 20, 40, 50, 65% of planets, or 65% of stars have small planets. So very common, we can see that from this graph. So again, these are easy to find. So when we look at graphs of exoplanets, we see lots of them, but they're not too common. And the takeaway here, more small planets than large ones. Uh, here's another graph where we can see some of this information. Here's orbital period in days. So remember how long it takes to go around and planetary radius. 
So if we're thinking of the Earth, it lies here at one Earth radius, and it's got a period of about 300 days, so Earth lies right in this box right here. And notice we don't have any planets detected within that box. And again, this is a selection bias. So all of these planets up here are because of a detection bias. They're easy to find, they're bigger, they have short periods, um, but we'll be able to fill in this region as uh, Kepler data is analyzed. It was designed, so Kepler was designed to find Earth-like planets around sun-like stars. Now, the sun was less variable than other stars of its type, and so it was less successful of a mission than it is intended to be. It turns out that it needed a couple of extra years to get the robust statistics that it was needed to find uh, Earth-like planets. Um, so it did have some trouble fulfilling its mission, but um, as we keep combing through that data, we should be able to fill in this lower part and find these planets that have the same size and orbital period, which, remember, relates to orbital distance um, as the Earth does. So keep your eyes on the news for that over the next few years. All right, now we're going to talk a little bit about the requirements for surface habitability. Um, some of this stuff we know, but just kind of putting it in broader terms, if we're going to be looking uh, outside of our solar system for planets, what are some of the things we need? Uh, so I'll just highlight some parts here. They need mostly circular orbits to allow for gentle seasonal variations. They need to lie within the habitable zone, mostly and they would need to be large enough to retain internal heat for billions of years. So remember plate tectonics, um, magnetic field, those things that help protect the climate and the atmosphere, um, you need heat for both of those. So these first three are kind of requirements. And then the last two here, is just saying that we may not necessarily look for planets, so not just planets. Um, that should say and uh, large moons and super Earths could also preside necessary requirements for Earth and the super Earths. Um, so not just planets, not just habitable zone. So these large moons, um, if they're around some of these close-in Jupiters, they could have liquid oceans at the surface. Think of, uh, if you're a Star Wars fan, think of the moon of Endor, uh, a large forested moon around a um, gas giant planet. Um, that was actually filmed uh, just north of here near Crescent City. Um, and then, so those uh, large moons uh, could be habitable, maybe a good place to look for life. And uh, super Earths might be neat uh, because they can uh, have thicker atmospheres, uh, more greenhouse gases, and so maybe a much wider habitable zone uh, than is traditionally thought of for terrestrial planets. All right, what about surface, subsurface life? Now, we talked about this a little bit, um, that planets like Mars and moons, such as Europa and Ganymede, uh, they could have subsurface uh, reservoirs of liquid water, which would mean subsurface um, life. Turns out these super-Earths that we've been talking about, uh, they might also have deep underground oceans heated by their large cores. If they have larger cores, there's more radioactive material, they would be generating more heat because of that radioactive decay. Uh, same heating mechanism that's heating Earth's core, uh, just more powerful. 
Now, orphan planets, rogue planets, we mentioned these a little bit. These are planets that have been ejected from the planetary system. And uh, they could have enough internal heat com- com- coupled with a thick atmosphere laden with greenhouse gases to insulate uh, and heat them. So they, because there is no star around them, oops, so they could have very thick atmospheres. This is because if there's no star nearby, there's no solar wind which means there's no stripping of the atmosphere. So they could have much thicker atmospheres because they're out isolated in space, and that thick atmosphere may make them habitable even though there is no star close by. So I don't know how we would find these rogue planets, um, so they may not be a good place for us to look for life, but it's good to keep our um, options uh, open. It's good to keep an open mind. So, here's a quick thought question for you. Can life be detected on exoplanets? So, do we have detection techniques? Please take a moment to think about this quietly on your own. All right, currently, our technology only allows us to look for indirect signatures of life. So we can't see life directly. Uh, We can do spectrographic analyses. So by analyzing the spectrum of light coming from the planet, which is nice because we can do without actually seeing the planet. Well, we have to see it, but it doesn't need to be resolved. We don't need to be able to take a picture of it just as long as we can get a little bit of light from it. Um, the spectrum can reveal indirect signatures, things like abundant liquid water, um, an ozone layer, uh, abundant O2, um, and even chlorophyll can be detected Um, so, uh, none of these are actually life, but we've talked a lot about how it was the cyanobacteria here, biologic processes that caused Earth to have abundant oxygen, how this abundant oxygen is very beneficial because it provides lots of energy for life. Uh, When you have that, you have an ozone layer, which also prevents ultraviolet light and protects life, how we need abundant liquid water. So all of these things um, would be good indicators of life, even though they're not life detected directly. So this is what we mean by indirect signatures of life. All right. So the last thing we're going to talk about here is what's called the rare earth hypothesis. Hypothesis. So we just talked about how Earth-like worlds are relatively common. We think they're, they're everywhere. Although our Earth has some lucky things that have happened to it, some very lucky features, and without those things, uh, life, especially intelligent life, would, we think, not be possible. And so despite these planets being common, Um, we may have a lucky Earth that, um, yeah, can support life. So some of these things, uh, we talked about how um, there's a habitable zone in the solar system, but it turns out there's a galactic habitable zone too. So if we're too close or too far from the center of the galaxy, it's unlikely that life can form. So at the center of the galaxy, there is lots and lots of star formation. There's lots and lots of big um, blue stars, big O and B type stars with lots and lots of ultraviolet radiation. And so in the, the central stars, 
would likely sterilize um, any planets that are around. Now, if you're too far out in the galaxy, there isn't much star formation going on. There's not a lot of generations of stars that have happened, and so there's less enrichment in heavy elements. So if we're too far away, these distant suns, they potentially lack heavy elements. So this is often called the galactic habitable zone. And it turns out that where Earth is, sort of in the suburbs, on the edge of one galactic arm, we talked about our galactic address, um, is kind of just in the right place as far as the galactic habitable zone goes. Now, another thing that we didn't talk much about here this semester is that Jupiter acts like a shield. And it can instigate, which might have been good early on, but it also regulates planetary impacts. And so Jupiter is just the right size and place to act as a shield. So Jupiter protects Earth. Um, any comets that come in from the outer solar system are often deflected or eaten up by Jupiter before they come in and crash into the planets in the inner solar system. So Jupiter is like a big shield out there that protects us. Now, there are lots of giant planets. We've seen in the plots today that there are lots and lots of big planets. Um, but whether or not those solar systems, the architecture is right, where the big planets are outside of the smaller planets and they're acting to shield them may be a lucky coincidence. Now, we have talked about the moon um, and how it helps regulate our climate because it helps stabilize our orbit. We also have plate tectonics, so these are things we've talked about um, quite a bit, having a large moon and plate tectonics. Now, plate tectonics might be fairly common on planets that are the right size, although Venus doesn't seem to have plate tectonics, so we're not sure about that. And uh, we think the moon being formed by a giant impact was probably a very unlikely um, occurrence. Um, but really, we don't know how common either of these features are. We need more data. But these three are Earth's lucky features. And so we don't really know... Uh, if this is luck, we keep calling it that, uh, but we need more evidence. So it may be that these features um, are common. There are lots of planets, or rather I should say lots of stars in this galactic habitable zone. Um, so there's probably lots of planets. Uh, we see a huge variety of different architectures for solar systems. Um, and so there are probably many just like our own. So having a large planet out there to protect it may not really be all that uncommon. Uh, for me personally, I think it's this moon one. Having a large moon is probably very unlikely. Um, out of all these scenarios, that's probably the luckiest thing that has happened. So, um, I think that's all we have for today. Uh, really all we have for the semester, I guess. So it has been a pleasure, uh, despite the um, difficult, extremely difficult circumstance that we've all faced this semester. Um, I've been very happy with this class. It's been fun to teach. And I want to thank you all very much for sticking it out and um, being engaged with the class uh, through all this. So thanks a lot. Please don't hesitate to email me if you have any questions about the final. Uh, there's still time to uh, chat via email or Zoom to pick up those extra credit uh, points if you want. So uh, don't be shy. I'm here for you. All right. Take care.